Welcome. It's Nobody Asked Us with Des and Kara, presented by TCS. This is Kara Goucher, your co-host, and I'm joined by my co-host, Des Linden. <laughs> hey, Des, how are you? I'm great. You did a fantastic introduction. <laughs> and, Someday um, we'll show all the bad ones. We'll have a, a whole list real for it. It'll be great. It'll be, It'll be great. But that was a good one. So congratulations on that. And I think it's a good start for um, an amazing podcast episode. I think we're both pretty hyped about our guest today. And also just a side note that we wouldn't even have a YouTube channel if it wasn't for our guest who literally bullied me into (laughs) into having us put it up on YouTube. So do you want to say who's with us today? Well, we already know this person is a bully, so (laughs) it should kind of narrow it down a bit. bit. Um, Yeah, I think we're excited to bring on our friend and co-worker at times and also amazing athlete decathlon from Texas, competed in the Olympics in Beijing and was a silver medalist 2012 in London, also multiple time world champion, Um, kind of a big deal, Trey Hardy. Welcome. Thank you both. (laughs) I am so happy to be here. And I just want to go on the record to say I wasn't bullying Kara. I was just <laughs> strongly suggesting and and just letting her know that something was missing. Actually, from those let's, first couple let's of be episodes. real. You brought it up. And I was like, yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe someday. And you go, but no, because no. I like to. And you just kept going. And finally, I was like, oh, my God. OK, I'll talk to Des. We'll get it on YouTube. I was just bringing you the information I was getting from the streets. All right. Brand, brand ambassador. He's known, right? Yeah. So I yeah. feel like for the brand, he was like, this is, you know, yeah. a bigger picture, but a lot and of pressure. You, <laughs> and then you got the live show. Now you've got a sponsor. Now it's it's all, you know, just I'll send you my wiring instructions for the, the <laughs> 20% the marketing invoice. fee. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say wiring as in microphones, and then you were going to hold up your loose cable because you didn't, we can do that. You didn't have a professional one. <laughs> the people just listening in their car won't get it, but yeah, the people so you, watching the feed. <laughs> That's this is how you drive YouTube traffic because Trey's showing us his mic that he's using. Testing, testing. You guys hearing it? Yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> it sounds how, really good. Sounds how are good Trey's online. levels? It could be better if you plugged it in, but it sounds great. Yeah. I did I'll that plug once it in tonight. It'll probably get here while we're recording. I did that once in an NBC show where you're doing all the stuff and getting ready. And they're like, "We can't hear you." I'm like, oh, "It's not plugged in. It's not the plugged home, in the home kit." You know, yeah. Uh, like this thing. But anyway, yeah, guys, I'm so Sorry. happy when you both announced that this is something you were going to do. I think it's long. I mean, long overdue. It needed to. Like the world needed this. There was a huge gap and just a desert of your perspectives and and the, the careers that you both have and the one that you're still having does the one that like just people want that insider stuff and the i think the title is just perfect because that's kind of the way both of you are are just so unassuming casual people met you on the street that have no idea what badasses you are and you coming at it from that angle just keeps it yeah i love listening to it so really, really honored to be here and yeah, happy to know you both. Well, you're already a great guest. You've made up for that bullying thing. Go I, on. Yeah, keep, that's definitely going to be like an ad for our show, Trey right. talking about it. Okay. Um, well, we do want to talk yeah. about you though, because like we asked you to be on the show. So Des introduced you as this monster decathlete, which is true, two-time world champion, NCAA record holder, NCAA champion, I think twice, Olympic silver medalist. But how did you get into the decathlon? it kind of chooses you a little bit. And I, it's like this, it, it's not totally dissimilar to, to marathoning. I think there are just like crazy, like, I don't know, people that like kind of choose the marathon earlier, just wild to me. And that's the same with the decathlon. Like, so for myself, I was just a pole vaulter, um, just fell in love with it, saw somebody doing it. It is the coolest thing in track and field. It's like, it's the the thing on the pictograph, like one of these things is not like the others. Okay, that one's diff that one's different. Saw somebody doing it at my high school and just said, That's cool. I want to try that and did it for a couple of weeks. Freshman year was, you know, wasn't good. Did it for a couple of months the next season. Just there was more time. Uh, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And 
was was okay, like made it to state. And then by the spring of my junior season, I was just running track. And so I got to do it for like three or four months from like, you know, January into May. And then same thing. So my senior year, I trained all fall and then got to do it the rest of the spring. But that was kind of it. I didn't really mess around with anything else. I ran the 300 hurdles a, a few times and then I signed a book scholarship to uh, Mississippi State. So I wasn't even that good, but I had, you know, there was something there. And then after I signed, I started like messing around with all the other events, um, ran the hundred. Turns out I was really fast. Um, I forget what I ran. I ran 1080, like 1080 something um, in the prelims at state and then like sprained my ankle. So didn't really get to like, like, you know, you're going to run faster in the final kind of thing. So I get to school and still think I'm going to be a pole vaulter. And they're like, hey, you're tall you're fast. You kind of already know how to do the hardest event to teach. So we're, you're going to train for the decathlon. We think that there's points there at the conference level. You could, you could be a, a all conference, you know, all SEC uh, decathlete. And I'm like, well, what are, okay. What are all the events? What do I, what are we doing here? So I go from this like really fun thing to train for gymnastic and athletic to just, I hated going to track every day. I hated the training. I didn't understand why I was doing any of it. I'd never, I'd never, I didn't know what lactic acid was. You know, I'd never run so hard it produced any, and I never, had never thrown up after a workout. I'd never like been sore after a workout. It was just like, what is, what is this? And I was scrawny. I was like six three, 155 pounds when I showed up, and I would assume this is like marathoning. You do your first one, and you're like, I okay, I get it, I get it now. I'm going to come back and kick this thing in the teeth and the people, all the people that just beat me, I'm going to get there and I'm going to beat them. Now I know why I'm putting in the work. Now I know why I'm doing this. And just as a competitor, I got to, I got to compete 10 times. You know, I got to do 10 different events. There were 10 different challenges and 10 different skills and um, just became addicting a little bit. And when you have early success too, I, I had a lot of early success was like, I'm on the right path. It's like a lot of affirmation and a lot of fun winning. So feel free to chime in. Feel free to talk. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just here. No, I love that. Um, yeah. What, I mean, that obviously changed. It was like an identity thing. When did you go from being like flirting with this sport? I'm into it to being like, this is who I am. And then creating goals of like the highest levels. Uh, I, my freshman year, I was, I was all American in the decathlon. I think I got fifth place. And w now all of a sudden I'm Trey Hardy, all American decathlete. And it was like, wow, I, I think maybe I could be really good at this. I'm going to, I'm going to train with a fervor and make this like, see how far I can go. Um, at the time I was still an engineering major, wanted to get a good degree, would probably going to move back to Alabama and do something in the lines of like architectural engineering or something with building science and then uh qualified for the uh olympic trials in 2004 and i was lining up against the eventual gold olympic gold medalist the reigning world champion and i was right there with them i was like oh there's there's life after college and i'm just as good as those guys i think i could make an olympic team and from then it just became a, I mean, as much as you can sacrifice in college, you know, you're still, I'm 19, 20 years old. I'm really not making all the best decisions, but I'm, I'm, I'm focused on, on making an Olympic team and being kind of the best I could be and winning an, an NCAA title. And it was at that time I transferred to the university of Texas and that was a, that's a professional track team. I mean, that was, we had all the, the facilities are, are amazing. The support is amazing. The city, the town, like it was just, okay, I'm where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I, I within two seasons, I, you know, won a national championship set and I set the collegiate record. And so now I'm this, I'm the next guy. I'm the next American decathlete that's going to do really well on the international stage, which really that was, there was a roadmap, you know, there were these guys that have gone before me 
Dan O'Brien and Tom Pappas and Brian Clay, it wasn't this, how, how am I supposed to do this? Like no one, no one from America's ever done this, this, oh no, it was, we've done it. We're the best at it. Just be patient and move along. And so by the time I signed my first professional contract, I was, there were no other things in my life. There were, it was, it, it's so, it's so trite. And I think because we're from this, the running community, it gets used a lot around us, but I was wholesale into giving anything less than my best was going to sacrifice the gift. I knew the gifts that I had been given and I'd just been blessed to have been put in, in the places at the times I was placed there and got to express my talents, got to really see how far I could take it and nothing was standing in my way. Did you feel pressure to be the next great American decathlete star or were you excited about it? Like, did you feel like, no, this is where I'm supposed to be? Or did you ever feel like, oh, this is bigger than me? No, no, not at all. Because there was always the next guy above me. And I, we have a lot of respect and we have, we have friendship and we have, there's this brotherhood of decathletes, but I was going to take it from Brian Clay. That was like that as little or as much external motivation as necessary. I still wanted to be the best I could be, but I was going to go take it from somebody. And that somebody just happened to be an American. So Which he, as, we only ever competed against each other like twice because after, after he won in 2008, it was, he was like two time Olympic medalist. He was like this bigger than life entity and was kind of on the back end of, I think a couple of, or one of his contracts. And so he was just, he had a huge family. I don't know how he did it. He had three kids when he was, when he won the gold medal, it's like, now I'm like, holy crap, that's even more impressive. <laughs> like, yeah. As um as marathoners, we can only train so many hours of the day and it's like you'd get your run in and that's it. But it seems like this is all encompassing. Like how much of the day did it take up? How much time did you spend training? And then when you looked back at the achievements, did you feel like this is totally justified or how did how did those moments feel when you reached the peak? Like, did it feel like it was worth it? Yeah, no, zero regrets. Um okay. I, I was training, you know, you're training 25 hours a week in college on top of classes. So that puts you at like 40 hours a week of like, for me, available time that I'm can do work and then still recover. And there's so many skills. I, I we became really good at like getting free, cheap and easy work that wasn't pounding on my body, like learning a skill without it taking it away from anything was really the trick. And I was putting in 40 hours a week, like easy. So maybe a little less in the fall and a little less in the summers, like in that, in those, like really we're peaking. We don't have to train as much. The quality is really high. It was a job for me. And it was something that I took pride in my preparation. I took pride in the recovery stuff that I did. I took care of my body. I, I wasn't making a ton of money early on, but I spent it all on like massage therapy and chiropractic care and physios and travel and making sure I had a, you know, a first class seat on a plane. Like those were the, like the investments I made in myself. And I took it very seriously as a, this, this is the business and I'm going to invest in the business. And I I wasn't looking at like, I, I didn't look at life after track really. Like I knew I had some safety nets to take care of like, a few months or like even I I could have probably moved back in with my folks for a year and they wouldn't have said anything and I could have gotten on my feet and figured it out. So I was never like, "Mm, okay, what's next? I need to make sure I've got all my ducks in a row. Um, Like I'm sure we'll cut in and out, but I, every red cent that I made in track and field, the bonuses, the contracts, all the money, I bought rental property in Austin, Texas. Who knew that was going to be the, most appreciate like if you bought something in 08 till 2021 you know 2022 and and this year i mean you look like a genius and so i had sown lots of seeds in 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 that and that was my transition plan to like for when i retired or for when the the sport was no longer part of my life to buy me some time 
essentially. And it got to the point where like, if I, like if I didn't get married or, and we didn't have a, this big, beautiful family that we have now, I would never, I wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't need a job. I wouldn't be doing anything. I'd just be honestly like <laughs> making deposits <laughs> in the bank, you know? Um, yeah. I would have been a pretty, pretty, probably terrible bachelor to hang out with, but that was my idea of planning for the future. Yeah. Well, when you were in it, let's go back in time a little bit more. Let's go back to 08, your first Olympic Games. You're in the hunt for a medal. You're in fourth place. And you have a misstep. Talk to us about that and what that meant to you and how you got through that because obviously 09 was a magical year for you. Yeah, I mean, in 2008, like I it was still a part of this like early success phase of where I just, I woke up and did the work and went to bed and got better. There wasn't magic. It was just, I'm still growing. I'm still learning the event. That was my fifth year. 08 was my fifth year of doing the Cathlons. You know, I'd still done around like, it was like 13 or 14 of them. Um, Still really early, you know, but I was in, in your, in my head, I, I was still like, I'm, Trey Hardy, I'm a collegiate record holder. I'm I'm from Texas, and only one guy's ever beat has ever beaten me in the last couple of years, and it's the gold medalist. So I'm here to to kick ass and take names. And I was having an okay time. I had a good first day, and had a really poor uh, discus. Um, so mentally, it was like the first time I'd ever been kind of, ooh, okay, I, this isn't a home meet. This isn't even like the U.S. championships where I I know I can kind of weasel my way onto a podium here. This is a big deal. And my body's not feeling great. It's my first time out of the country, like competing. And it's an Olympic decathlon, which is like there's a morning session and an evening session. Instead of it being all in one little tight little six, seven hour package of a day, it's a 12 hour day now. And there's a huge morning session. Then you have a break which to me is almost a, it's a disadvantage because your body starts ratcheting into recovery mode and you want to rest and sleep, but you have to get back up for the evening stuff. So by the time the pole vault runs around, runs up, it's the third session in like the last 30 hours or less, maybe like 27 hours. It's the third Olympic decathlon session and it's at the end and it's like 102 degrees and it's hot as heck when you like you were talking about like the opening ceremonies was the most incredibly miserable time of my life and i did <laughs> it, was it. So gross. <laughs> it was disgusting i took my shirt off i was just wearing an undershirt and those like you could see through those pants it was awful <laughs> but i it was it hit me square in the jaw that i was incredibly and mentally unprepared for the that moment the grandness of that the things i i had just put off and put them in my back pocket and not even tried to process the what emotions I might feel and the pressure that I was telling myself there wasn't you know I was telling myself that no this is just hey, it's the same hey same lane 400 meters same runway same everything I'm good I'm good and didn't prepare mentally at all and I honestly the next thing I knew I was like waking up like in a movie where it just like like zooms in on the the main character and it's like time had slowed down and I just, I woke up and I had missed three times at my opening height and it was over, completely over. And I had lost my, like, I started crying. I was trying to find my, my coach, couldn't find him. I, I would immediately felt all this shame and guilt for all the people around me that had sacrificed their time, their, their money, their energy to support me to get there. And I just felt all of that hit me all at once on the pit. Like I hadn't even walked off the pit and it was just like, Oh no, my, my parents flew all the way out here. Like my coach left his family to be here. Like all the things just smacked me in the face. So how do you rebound? What are the mental tools you put together in? Was it a long process? Like, Hey, I know I have four years, so this is how I'm going to chip away at it. Like, how'd you prepare for the next big moment, which obviously came together pretty well? It was, it, it was a gut, kind of a gut check month. That whole month of September in the fall of 2008 was very much, okay, what kind of a person am I? Because up until that point, it was show up to the track. All right, what are we doing today, coach? 
instead of like, hey, I helped write this program. I know what I'm doing today. And I know all of the, I know everything, right? I, I, did, I didn't have a lot of ownership of what I was doing. And from a physical side, that's it, it's not the hardest thing in the world to do, but there's a lot more exposure, a lot more ego that goes out there when you you are taking ownership of it. There isn't like, well, my ah, man, my coach, we didn't run enough 150s this year, so my 400 sucked. It's like, no, I wrote the program, like it's on me. Um, and got to be a lot more involved with that and became more of a partner with with my coach. And then on the mental side, to me, that was the really big, I mean, that was 95% of why what had happened had happened. Um, just started to professionalize that and treat it just like its own event. And now I knew what the stage was. I knew the pressure and I started to gain tools for going through all of the possibilities that could, could or couldn't go wrong. You know, there, there's two buckets. There's things I can control there's, and there's things I can't. So I'm going to check all these boxes with the things that I can control. And I'm going to be so ready for the things that I can't. I'll never be surprised again. And I'll have already rehearsed any outcome. So that means like running the 100 meters into a headwind and having a number pop up that really sucks. Or coming down to my third attempt in the long jump with two fouls and knowing a safe jump is going to get me the points I need to progress, but not, it won't get me to where I know I might need to be to win. Um, what happens if my a shoe breaks? What happens if I forget something at the hotel? What ha- all of the, and, and I don't want it to sound like I'm like rehearsing negative things to happen, but I just took it to the extreme of like, I'm going to be ready for everything. So that when I'm in those positions again, I've already done it. You know, like I've already rehearsed it. Like it's, I would imagine if I ever do run a marathon, which definitely not doing that. Um, Probably going to happen. Yes, you're doing it. (laughs) I'm going to know, I'm going to rehearse mile 16, mile 21, one mile to go in my head to have already been there knowing, hey, you knew this was going to happen. Here's how you're going to handle it. Like already going through those, those emotions in deep meditative states. So they feel super real and that was that was kind of the only things that changed so that the next season i i mean i won my first us championships in 2009 with a terrible score uh but it didn't matter because i was already i'd already rehearsed winning with a terrible score and then i i went to gotsis which is like the mecca for multi events and it was just so cool and i was i went there and i got second wanted i went there wanting to win but i'd also gone there just saying like this experience is going to prepare me to see these guys again in Berlin at the world championships in a, in a few months. And I'll, I'll know who they are and I'll get them. So went in there, got second, um, was right off of an all time personal best. So by the time I get to Berlin, I'm like having a beer in the laundromat the day before the meet doing laundry, just shooting the bull with like guys that don't compete for two weeks, you know? Um, and in the moment it just, I was just flowing. I'd already done all of it. I'd already rehearsed it. I'd already, I took ownership of everything that was going to happen to me. And it just started clicking off. Like there weren't a ton of like lights out, like, oh, wow, traded what? Like that's a crazy performance. It was just solid, like this really, really solid thing. And that's how you you back into and put together a really high score. And it was, yeah, I think at the time it was the fourth high score in in U.S. history and like seventh all time in world history, and it was just like, here we go. I'm only I'm still only 24 years old. Let's go. You know, like yeah. You bring up something there that I find super interesting. Des and I were your teammates in Berlin, by the way. We ran the That's marathon, right. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> but. I'm thinking how we have to focus and be prepared to be really zeroed in for two and a half hours where you have to do it over and over and over again for two full days. And I know you're talking about doing it in practice, but did you work with a psychologist? Like, How did you get it so that you could get up 10 different times, multiple times, right? For each attempt, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, how did you find the energy? Like, cause I can't even imagine like running the marathon and then being ready, mentally ready two hours later to do something else. Do something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. When you add it all up, if you take all three attempts and you say maybe you get seven jumps and all the verticals and stuff like that, I mean, it's only like 20, it's like 20 to 25 minutes of work 
of oh. like on the on the runway work. What right? a slacker! <laughs> yeah, changes everything. <laughs> like a solid for me right now, like a solid five k is worth of work. And what I I, I don't remember if it was um, Dr. Flowers or Dr. Reardon. Um, who gave me kind of the tools of, of, of compartmentalization, just giving myself, I always gave myself five minutes to process what had happened, good or bad. I got five minutes to like high five, hoot and holler and be proud of myself, pat myself on the back, or five minutes to be legitimately angry, just be upset, you know, not like punching walls or throwing stuff, but just being like, I can be disappointed right now for five minutes. Then it's time to move on, change my shoes, do whatever, you know, nutrition was in the plan, whatever that is, hydration, whatever, get get work done for the next, uh, like body work and stuff, whatever it was that was in the plan, then start that next thing. And I got relatively good at compartmentalizing in between the events. And then one of my superpowers was what I started to just call like a light switch. I could, I can summon adrenaline like you can turn on a light. Like I can, my resting heart rate can be relatively high. I can be in, you know, over a hundred, but still feel incredibly calm and together. And then I can flick a switch. And before the attempts even happen, I'm at like 175, 180, and the engine's revved and ready to, ready to go and ready to run through a wall. And so I got really good at doing that, you know, attempt to attempt. And that, that in and of itself is the, your emotional energy tank by day two and especially by the pole vault you're you're done like you're really done if you can't bring yourself down in between events and in between attempts that's a long time to be on and it, it's you learn that over time i mean it's a it, the an old man's an old man's game that's fascinating i mean yeah when you break it down to the numbers and then you think about 20 some odd minutes of being hyper focused then you go to the marathon. It's like, where do you really have, how, how long do you turn off your brain? 10K, how long do you turn off your brain? It's, I mean, it's probably mentally being really sharp for a comparable amount of time, just the physical component, you know? For you both, like, and, and a, a course that you're familiar with maybe. So let's say Boston recent. I was in the news recently. I read, I read a couple of things on it. It was on, I scrolled through it, but I didn't see what happened. It's a new um, race, so I can understand. I <laughs> I just think, some clips. <laughs> yeah, I think it's new. Surprised like it was like a it. COVID COVID race yeah. thing. I don't know. Uh, when you guys mentally prepared for that race, that pressure, you done the course runs, you knew that stuff. Did you guys a lot time for like, okay, here's where I'm gonna kind of emotionally and mentally recharged because I know when I make this left-hand turn, it's, it's on for the next hour or how, how, how did you guys handle that? Cause there's no way to stop. I mean, you can't not, I don't know. That's a long time. That's a long time. So the, the general rule of thumb, and I think it for me anyhow, but I think it applies to most people is you run the first 20 with your head and you're strategic, you're calculated, the whole thing, it's that's all about planning and staying within yourself, conserving energy. And then the last 6.2, last six miles with your heart. And that's like, that's your flipping the switch, you know, and that's where you take energy from wherever you can get it. Crowd, um, your goals, like the people that helped you get there, all of those things come into play. And that's like, the guarantee is you're going to be tired at 20. Um, if it happens earlier, it's like, uh oh, this is kind of a problem. Maybe I didn't use my head that well early on. Mm -hmm. Um, but 20 is the, the start for the marathon. And that's when you just flip the switch and you race from there in is kind of my rule of thumb. Yeah, Sarah. I totally agree. I used to describe it like Trey's too young. He probably doesn't remember this, but at midnight, the TVs used to go off and it'd be like buzz. <laughs> I'm 40. And oh, you are. Oh, you're still a baby though. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I would imagine like the first 20 was like the fuzz on the TV. I couldn't think about my husband or my family or after I had Colt, like he didn't exist, right? I'm just in the fuzz. I'm just matching moves. But just like Des said, you hit that 20 mile mark and all of a sudden, maybe I am thinking about Adam. Maybe I am thinking about my family, mm. um, you know, and, and then you can, you still can't let a ton of emotion come in. I'm sure just like the decathlon, like you can't, then it, you want it too much and you make silly sloppy mistakes. Um, 
But then it would be like, you know, pulling inspiration from wherever and being really sharp because I knew moves were going to happen. But for that first 20, I totally agree with Des. It was kind of like the less thinking, the less energy, everything is just compact and, comp- you know, tight as possible until that, that last 10K. How do, you, how do you set up training? Like, how do you pick and choose those moments where you're like, I have to run on emotion in this workout because I'm out, I'm out of gas? Like, how do you set that up safely? I'm really curious. Like, what workout was that for each of you guys? I, I feel like that's sort of the beauty of the event is you don't ever really know what past 20 is going to feel like because that's where the recovery becomes too long that you're not going to adapt. You have to just back off and really recover. So you push right up to that feeling that you're going to get around 20. And then when you're out there racing, it's stepping in. And it's, it's frustrating because when you talk about the controllables, like, it's all unknown at that point. So that's where experience in the event matters. Um, but in training our, for a long time, I was with the Hanson and it was Hanson's program. It was c- cumulative fatigue. So you're doing the 120 mile week so that everything feels like the later part of the race. And you're just learning to run on really tired legs, really tired mind. It's just, it's pretty miserable. <laughs> and there's a mental strength that comes from that though, right? Like you, like, for all of, um, you know, my flaws with Alberto, he would have me like do a long run and throw on a weight vest. And the first time we did it, I was like, I hate you. But I actually think it did in a weird way help because it was like I was learning that I could still per- I could still continue on even when all the signals in my body were telling me no. But just like Des said, you couldn't do that week in, week out for 26.2 miles because – you're never going to make it to the starting line excited or happy. You know, you're going to be like totally, healthy. totally drained <laughs> or healthy. Yeah. So you ha- you can have those moments where you test yourself, but it has to be like in a safe environment. You have to be willing to pull the plug um, and you have to make like doing that. Then now all of a sudden I need an extra day of rest rather than one or two days. Now I need three. So you just have to work those things in where you need them. And, and I think like Des said too, the more you do the event, the more you learn what gives you confidence. And certain workouts that give you, like when I came back to Colorado, I had complete ownership of my training. I appreciated when you said that earlier, Mark and Heather, I I was like, this is what I need to feel ready. And I had ownership over everything. And I was able to put things in that had always given me confidence. And of course they were there to say, yeah, it fits here. No, it's too much there. Um, It was like a partnership though. But I learned over time, like what made me feel confident. I'm sure Des had the same, has similar. There's workouts she knows that if she knows she can go and nail that, she feels confident. I'm assuming. We'll get you a good plan, Trey. Don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. We're gonna, not going <laughs> to not gonna leave you out there to die. You'll get to the finish. Just a sub eight-hour, like, walk eight a mile, Eight hour. Mile. Give me a Same break. finish. Could, okay, let's get back to it. Trey here. Trey. Exactly. You Look win. At my Strava, or whatever the thing is, it's, my heart rate's at, like, 180 chucking like eight thirties. Well, you're going to have to use your skill set to bring that down. It's going to be fine. Which is I'll run three miles at a time, take an hour break and then run another three. I'll just try to do it before the sun falls down. Okay. Anyway, back to being about Trey. Trey, you win the world championship in 2009. You kind of became a huge star. I don't know if you remember, but we did a photo shoot together. Do you remember that? I've been waiting to ask you if you remember (laughs) since like... 2019 like <laughs> absolutely i totally remember it because i was like text I'm, I'm in the van with kara Cow. <laughs> like no we're going to the track right now no we're like running on a cur- i remember the workout we did were, like, you take a on secret a photo <laughs> i mean i don't think my phone had a camera at that no, point i don't think right. so it was a long it time was ago so bad yeah but you but it was be- in new york yeah it was in it new was york, in new york. It was yeah it was fun. And I got to know, like, I didn't really know you. I knew that you were like a mega star though. Like you be like decathlon is a big event in track and field. And obviously it's like considered the greatest athlete, the greatest athlete alive. Yeah. And you had just won the world championship. And so how did that feel for you going from, you know, you were kind of raising the ranks. You thought you could be good, but here you are now world champion. You're being put on a pedestal. You're being, you're in advertisements. Like, like I would have to imagine things intensified for you in that area. They did like in that regard, but it all felt like, you know, like I'm telling the story, like it all just felt like, here we go. We're still, I'm at, I'm on, still riding the hockey stick, like up. And it, it happened way sooner than I thought it would happen. 
Um, it was a big step up in the amount of points that I just scored. I beat a really good field. The Berlin decathlon at that time was the deepest, most competitive, highest scoring decathlon ever. And it was, it still hadn't sunk in. Um, it was de- a big, just stuff had just started to like, uh, I can't think of the word, but like harden, like, okay, the stuff that I'm doing now works. And I know it works. This isn't like a, let's see how this goes. It's okay. I've got the playbook. Okay, so next season, we're going to trim the fat. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. There's no world championships, but there was an indoor world championships. And it was like, well, let's just, let's train for that. Let's see how we want to, what we want to do outside. Maybe we do a decathlon, but let's get ready for the 2011 world championships. Ultimately, that was kind of the plan. And then I, I bought my, I built my first house with the the metal, the bonus money. Um, I was making more money than I ever thought I would make in my whole career as a base salary. And like you said, like, I'm really lucky. I was good at an event that shoe companies value, you know, um, we don't get to compete that often, but when we do, we're on TV quite a bit, you know, like uh, the people running those marketing departments grew up during an era that Bruce Jenner was a hero. He was America's hero and kind of carried that torch for a really long time until the whole Dan and Dave thing in 92 in Barcelona and then Dan winning Dan O'Brien winning gold in 96. And it was just this, like this just domino that just allowed me to have an opportunity to make, you know, more money than I probably should. And I didn't feel any pressure. It it just felt like this fortunate thing felt like I'm still doing what I love to do. And I'm still going to find out how good I can be. Someone's just going to be paying me for it now. You know, um, I just started officially, um, just started dating my now wife and mother of my three kids. And I, I spent the next season really, we spent the next season just dating. Like really we traveled, we didn't live in the same state. So we were, I was flying out to see her in California. She was flying to see me here in Austin and, uh, got to go on the, went on the, then it was golden league still at that point, but got to travel Europe with her and be her, you know, coach at, at a few different big meets and just enjoyed my time that year and kind of didn't like rest or coast, but it was like, all right, I've been running track really, really hard for seven, six, seven years now. I'm going to just recover because 2011 and 2012 are kind of important and I want to be fresh and I want to be ready. And that was kind of how I looked at that season. Wait, quick shout out to your wife. She's like a pretty legit pole vaulter. (laughs) Very more than legit. Yeah. She's like, I think she set the collegiate record while she was at UCLA a couple of times, won two national championships, both and then won an individual and a team championship. And two days before I won in Berlin, she won the silver medal in Berlin in the pole vault. She was Chelsea Johnson at the time, but now Chelsea Hardy and the best mom ever. That's awesome. Yeah. So you have everything going on. It's all onward, upward. The trajectory looks amazing I'm on I'm doing paper. photo shoots with Kara freaking Gaffer. <laughs> is there a moment where you have a setback or is this just like what we see on paper is how it went and we're, su- we're super jealous of you because it looks easy. <laughs> it looks so easy. <laughs> oh, no. Like, oh, yeah. I'm just following the plan, connecting the dots. This is this is simple. Or is it like, what are the bumps in the road? Any? Or was it as, as smooth as it sounds? Which is okay. So I, my, I end up, I have an indoor year of eligibility in 2007 and we're doing the last workout, the last lifting session where we're doing one rep maxes for power cleans and it hits my knee. And so it throws off the trajectory. Long story short, I still have a titanium screw right below my thumb here and the bone is pretty much dead. I still have pretty intense pain just doing push ups. I, could never throw the shot well again. So uh, that happens. I don't get to do the indoor heptathlon, but I run the hurdles and long jump. Um, My last like indoor senior season for Texas, I end up being all American in both just because that's all I could do. I could only compete. I couldn't run. I couldn't get the blocks. Like I was still in a brace. And that really, I didn't think I was going to even get a, a contract 
Like I don't, I didn't know if I was going to be able to throw the shot ever again. Didn't know if I was going to do a decathlon. Definitely couldn't throw a jab or disc or pole vault. Like it was, it hurt. Still, I mean, still hurts to this day. And it was scary, but I just, I was still on this like naive upswing where I'm like, that's oh, going to be okay. That'll be fine. I'm going to be fine. Looking back, I'm like, oh my god, that could have been that could have been it. And it really did like it really was frustrating for me. And I learned to just live with that. Like, this is how it is. Every time I threw shot, I was mad. I was really frustrated because I could not flick the shot. Like I couldn't put it on my fingers and do that. So I was just like a piston, just kind of pumping it out there. And I'm watching guys who are smaller, weaker, and worse technique throw farther. And it just is so it'd be like you running with only one shoe on, you're just handicapped. And so that was the first big setback. Um, and then in 07, my first year, which should have been my, it was my first contract year. I should have made the team, even despite this hand thing, I completely tore my gracilis. I say completely tore, it damn near sh like came apart. Uh, the gracilis is like this little stabilizing muscle off your pubic bone. So you're basically my groin. So I didn't even do a, a single event that whole year, not a single event. And it, obviously a big reduction in salary. So now I'm like, barely, I didn't save a single dime. I spent everything that I made that year because um, it was reduced because I didn't make the world championship team in 07. And that, that injury prohibited me from sprinting. That happened in May of 07. And I didn't, I wasn't able to sprint until the Texas relays, which are in late March or early April, the following year, I wasn't able to like actually run. I could grind out like 42 second 300s, couldn't run anything faster without debilitating pain. And then all of a sudden I woke up one day, um, I drove to Fort Worth to see a physiotherapist that I thought had the, you know, the magic to fix me and did a bunch of like fascial stuff with me. And I woke up like a week and a half later and I could run again. And it was just, what is happening? I didn't, I didn't know what was happening. I was like, what kind of, what'd you do to me? Can I come, can you come down here? Can I go back? Like, I need to see you more often. Um, and that was kind of it. There's like, there's little stuff here and there, you know, like I'm pounding, I'm, but I'm taking really good care of my body. Uh, that was something I took a lot of pride in. And I think the reason why I had such a long career is because I, it took me 45 minutes to an hour to warm up in the weight room. It took me 30 to 45 minutes to warm up for anything outside. And I, I actually had like closing exercises and cool downs and all the stuff. And I never didn't cold tub. I always got massage and physiotherapy. I, I made a big investment in that, knowing that I wanted to do this for as long as I could and not be this whew, like this flash in the pan. And then we're not quite there yet on the story, but the big one would be that little guy. This is why you should watch. The YouTube channel, um, just a big zipper on my elbow that I, I sustained uh, winning my, my second world championships in Daegu in South Korea. So you get injured in Daegu, but you win. You end up yes. having surgery on your arm. Was Did you have the surgery then? I flew home, got some images, and they were like, yeah, this is this is pretty messed up. Like pronator mass is done, triceps is, is torn off, and um, they couldn't even find my UCL. Um, so they're like, yeah, this is this is Tommy John's, and maybe maybe it works, you know? Um, and so I ha ended up having the surgery September 17th, 2011. And then there's so much we want to talk to you about, but I can't skip over the fact that less than a year later, you win an Olympic medal. So... Yeah. How, what was that build up like? Obviously, Ashton Eaton, one of the greatest of all time. You guys have to go head to head. You're dealing with this recovery. How do you get yourself on that team? And how do you get yourself into a medal position at the Olympic Games? I'm going to just something you just said. Ashton is the greatest of all time. Not I know, one of I know, I know he is, but I want to make sure best. that everyone knows you helped raise the bar so that Ashton could be who he is. That's the only thing I want to say. I love Ashton. And this is one thing I will just really quick talk over you to say. <laughs> the men in the decathlon are so nice to each other and supportive of each other. And it's really, really 
cool to see. And Trey really, I mean, I always knew that because they like cheer each other on and, you know, they walk around together. Same with the heptathlon. But Trey really pointed it out when we were in Tokyo and it is so cool. And I, as soon as I said that, as soon as it came out of my mouth that like, he's one of the great, I was like, he's going to correct me. And then then he just did. Kind of a bully that way. (laughs) That's where I'll go after you. Um, It really is. And that's what kept me in it for as long as it did too. Um, I just, it's a brotherhood. You all have so much respect for what the other person is putting in. You know, there's no like lucky, you know, you get a flyer on the start or you get some, this isn't luck. You don't get to where those guys get to without putting in all the effort and the time and the sacrifice. It's not it's not magic. It's like hard work and it's years and years, decades of, of really, really hard work. So it, it's just born out of respect. And then it, it, you're out there together for so long that, there, I mean, there's two ways to be. There's the way that we kind of tend to be. We're supportive. We cheer each other on because a rising tide fly, floats all boats. Um, when someone else is doing really well, it helps me do better. There's a, There's an extra thing. I can't create that in practice. I need somebody and this, this whole group of men around me pushing me to do well. And the other way of being is negative and not having fun and isolated. And it's like, screw that. Like the guy, the person that wants to be that is never going to find success and never, really never going to be happy. You know? Um, it's a lot longer day that way. It's for sure. A, a miserable day. And I, I've, I've done it. I've been that guy. Like I've, I've been that guy and it's, I'm glad I was that guy early, you know, like at a couple of college meets and figured it out relatively quickly that it's it's way easier if you do it the other way around. Um, so that that whole season back to circling way, way back, that was I, I woke up out of surgery, you know, you, you can't move my hand, can't move my fingers. And I'm just crying because I'm like, that was it. I I, I don't get the chance to rectify what happened in 2008. I don't get to defend my title. I don't get to like, I, I was just so sad. And a couple of days later, I just kind of had a moment with myself and said, you know what, a year from now, I'm going to look back on, on this moment. And I just want to be proud of, proud of myself. And I, I'm okay with not making the team. And I'm okay with whatever outcome comes out of this. Now, it didn't help like the pressure because obviously people think like, all right, the Olympics are going to be on in a couple of weeks. And they, those advertisements you see with those athletes are filmed in like early mid 2011. Like they've already selected their people guys. It doesn't matter, which is why in 2012 you saw more of me than you saw of Ashton. Cause I was the guy Ashton was number two. We, we wanted to do the Dan and Dave thing, but like, there was a lot of things set in motion that I now had media obligations to go out and say and kind of lie through my teeth saying, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be ready. You know, like I'll be ready to, to do this and we'll see you in London, you know? And I was terrified that that wasn't going to be the case. And I just had a moment where I said, you know, I got to be okay with that. I've had a really good couple of years and I just want to look back and be proud of the effort and the work that I did. I just want to look back and say, wow, that there's nothing more I could have done. And it, that was like, I think it was like September 29th or 30th or something like that. It was just a, a you know, 10 days after surgery. And I started meticulously um, writing down all the reps that I did, keeping track of all the rehab. I, I went from you know, rehabbing twice a day to three and four times a day, like the same, like real rehab. So stacking together all of this volume and all this really unsexy stuff, like just touching your fingers together and just rotating your hand, holding a little, you know, can of beans to try to just get my arm to straighten. And it was, it was boring and it was monotonous and it was awful. And I still did not throw a javelin until early June. I, I was scared to do it, scared to pick it up. And I threw it and it went like 20 meters and was like, oh God. And it hurt really bad and was like, all right, well, we've been talking about doing things left-handed. So, all right, I got three weeks to figure this out. And I start throwing left-handed. And the week before, I'm like, okay, I, I can 
every other throw is going 20 meters left-handed. This is pretty bad. And I just, I get a flyer into the, the Olympic trials that year, just because I'm a reigning world champion, you're automatically entered and just said, all right, I'm just going to, I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to compete and I'm going to be happy with the outcome because there's nothing more I could have done. Like absolutely nothing more. And I made the team. So <laughs> You made the team and at the Olympics yeah. you got a silver medal. Yeah. So it, it's not Olymp- like you just had fun. You like had fun <laughs> and actually did something that Des and I had dreamt of doing our whole lives. So thanks. Yeah. But it, it was, again, I'm really lucky and I'm really blessed. And I, one of my the most, the best part about me is I'm really tall. I've got really good letters. You're so, really tall. And that makes things easy. It really does. It puts, it puts me at a huge advantage in a lot of things. And I could, I was fast. So I needed my elbow to do some stuff to, to like lift and train and do some resisted stuff, but I could still run. I was in the shape of my life uh, going into the trials because, Hey, this crappy javelin doesn't, that means you're going to have to run for it. Right. I'm going to have to run the 1500 and I didn't score very high and I didn't run the 1500 that fast. I think I ran like, I don't even remember what I ran. Might have been in the four forties or four fifties because I was literally I was watching my buddy Ashton break the world freaking world <laughs> record and it was really cool. Um so I got to watch that and I I think I have like 250 meters to go when he's finishing. Uh he almost lapped me and um I just it was I was the happiest I'd ever been. I shouldn't have made the team but I did and the same was true with London. So now I have a re- I'm like not even top 10 in the world score wise after the trials like that so this is like oh Trey Trey's that's that's the ceiling he's not going to throw that far he's not in great shape but he's you know 8200 point shape 8300 points that doesn't win medals it doesn't get you in a top you know 10 and London rolls around and I'm same feeling as like before Berlin I'm chilling having a beer no stress shouldn't have even been here doing my appearances um hanging out like we I got to, I, we actually did the pre-camp with Ashton in Germany so I'm like he he sees how not serious I'm taking it um and he's just such a young kid there's no and there's no big media like appearances I think he was p he did like png appearance and that was kind of it but like he was it was such a great camp because we were both just like eh, whatever like this is gonna be fun dude it's gonna be really fun Cause he, it, yeah, this wasn't his first go around either. So yeah, I, I got into to London and all the work started to actually like show itself. You know, I ran a lot faster and jumped a lot farther. I threw a lot better. I pole vaulted well. And it came down to the javelin where I'm in, I'm in second place going into the javelin after the pole vault. And I've got a couple of, you know, badasses on my heels that could throw the jab really far. So if I throw what I threw, at the trials, I don't win a medal. Like you can just look at it, do the math. Don't win a medal if that happens. So I'm at the back of the runway saying to myself, you know, I'm never going to be back here. I know how special this is. And this might be the last time I ever throw a javelin, but I'm going to, I'm going to throw it. And I don't care. I, this is what I said to my coach. I don't care if I hurt myself again, I got to give myself a chance to do this, or I'm going to look back and regret it. I'm going to look back and regret my effort and um, all the work that I'd done to get there was going to be for naught. You know, when I say I'd sacrificed, guys, I, I didn't do, I worked my ass off and not just like the cool, sexy running montage work. <laughs> I was up at, you know, 5.30 every morning doing dumb rubber band garbage stuff that, again, helped me be ready, but it also turned my shoulder into a laser rocket shoulder you know it also got my core stable it also just instilled this like discipline like oh if i'm doing this for my elbow what else could i be doing what else is something free and cheap and easy i could be setting up so i'm you know i'm at the back of the runway with not all that specificity in my head but just that like i've done too much like we've come too far and i throw from a short approach and it goes 10 meters farther than it did at the trials and so it's like boom confirmation we're winning a medal. And then a, the guy from Cuba, Lionel Suarez, who was, has medaled at like the last four consecutive major championships, Olympics, worlds and worlds. He throws like 70, 
I think he's got a 78 meter personal best. He's unreal. He bombs one. And I'm like, oh, shit. okay. All right. Okay. I got a medal. I got a medal. I got a medal. I'm trying to like talk myself through being one and done. And I walk back, I'm talking to my coach and he's like, he's doing the, the cut it. We're done. Cut it. And I'm like, well, Hey, it still feels okay. Like, I don't think we're doing damage here. You, you saw what he just threw. And he's like, yeah, but hey, you're fit. You're gonna, you are so fit. You're gonna run so fast in the fifth. This is in the 15. And the back of my head's like, hey, if you throw farther, you don't have to run as fast. <laughs> in the 15. But I was just like, you know, I don't, I'm gonna regret not taking the second attempt. I'm hitting it. I'm gonna hit it hard. I'm gonna hit it a lot harder. And he's like, okay, fist bump, walk out. And I throw within like two and a half feet, two feet of my all time personal best. Like, I have no idea how it happened. Man, G- Jesus took the wheel, little angels flew that sucker up there. And it was just this magical, magical moment. Um, I blacked out, just ran around the track. Like, I don't remember. It was during like the 10K medal ceremony or something. <laughs> it was during an actual Maris. You can hear the music. You can hear them giving out the medal. Like, you can hear it. I was so disrespectful, but I, I was like, I'm throwing. I, I'm, the light switch is on. I don't have any more adrenaline for this. I got to go. I'm throwing right now. And I PR'd in the 1500, having didn't have a reason to run, didn't have to run it hard, but I ran super slow through the eight and was like, oh, I should probably run harder than this. This is, I don't, I got to sell it, you know, and ended up PRing. So I was, yeah, I was super fit and I'd done all the work and it made it, made it to where I could enjoy that, those, you know, three and three quarter laps around the track. And still, aside from when my wife told me she'd marry me and the birth of the three, our three kids, this is it. That was the, that's the coolest, best thing that's ever happened to me by far. Not to quote you back to you, but at the beginning of that, you said you got lucky, you know, I got lucky and I got on the team. I got lucky and I had, I got this medal. And then you start reeling those things off and like, that's the lifetime of hard work. That's the cumulative effect. That's you learning your sport that's like the student side it's not you know it's it's not luck that's the thing and it feels like it on the day and sometimes you get a hot day in your 10,000 meter global championship and you take advantage of it and it's not luck and you get a rainy day in Boston and you put things together and it's not luck and so I just needed to say that try it that none of that's luck you know and I think your competitors respect that and fellow athletes get that so you know. Yeah, I I can appreciate that, and I think the way I don't disagree, and but the way that I I I feel about it, and maybe this is a way of like also compartmentalizing success and failure in a way. I didn't get to choose my parents, I didn't get to decide really who recruited me, and I I didn't get to all those things that were really things that happened to me, and I'd look at them maybe not lucky is the right word. And you're right. Maybe it's more of a blessing, but I was blessed to go on the path that I went on and have the people around me. The, like those aren't, those weren't like unique thoughts. Like my coaches challenged me after Beijing to professionalize, you know, the people that were in the athletic training room at Texas showed me all of the little dumb stuff. But you did the dumb stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. But you, that's more like what I'm saying. I was just, I was blessed, very, very blessed in that. I say I say this all the time at my my new job. It's it's like someone who's got a gift in music and can see music and feel music and they pick up an instrument and they can just do it. That's and then when they're 25, they're the best in the world and you're like, "Wow." I mean, yeah, they put in the work, but it didn't feel like work to me. I was doing something that I knew I was supposed to be doing that felt great. That it was just this beautiful, positive feedback loop of, oh, the work I do means I get better. When I get better, it's more fun. And all that, like, it was this thing at, at the time where I was just like, I was in a movie, right? It was just, yeah, a blessed experience. And yeah, I did the work. I did a lot of the work. Um, but it was, that that's more like what I was saying. But I agree with you. I agree with you too. I don't, want to, I don't want to undersell it, but like, there's a lot of work, but it's a I lot guess, of work. Yeah. No, I, think I never want to be it, that. I'm not a like back patty. Like it was, you know, it was all me. I woke up every right. day. I grinded. Like I'm that's not. What, that's what we're, we're here for. Yeah. Cause I yeah. feel like we're going to tell you that. 
other people, I, you know, I think sometimes have to remind you and point it out. And a lot of champions are very humble, but if you've put in any effort and tried to be the best at something, you can appreciate that there's some luck or blessings involved for sure. But at the end of the day, you make the choices and do the work and all of the things. So it's this combination. And yeah, I think we can all appreciate that. Well said. So Trey, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you is because by all outward appearances, you have the perfect life. Sunglasses are going on. This is Pretty crazy. Good. Yeah. You have yeah. Olympic medal. You're a two-time world champion. You unfortunately got injured during the 2016 Olympic trials, but immediately got hired by NBC at the trials, as I recall. Amazing. Yeah. Um, you have three amazing kids. You have a beautiful wife. You have all your rental properties. It seemed like from the outside, you just shifted into this next phase of your life. And a couple of weeks ago, Des and I heard you on a podcast and you talked about that struggle and I could relate to it so much, but I didn't know that you had felt that way because by, just like I said, by all outward appearances, you made this flawless transition into the next phase of life. And one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you today is we wanted to talk about how hard it is to, to transition away from elite competitive sport because that you're, you're, you talking about it and being open about it, it just really, really struck a chord with Des and I. Well, yeah, it's a big, it's a big topic and it's hard to like jump into it at any point, but I think we can, for myself, um, and thank you both, both of you texted independently that we're, and you've always been supportive. And I think that's what our, that running community is. Like, I think everyone unfortunately does share that. And if that the show life after the game, um, podcast taught me anything, it's that, wow this is a, it's a big deal and it's a big issue and it's, I don't want to call it like a problem, but it's just a big part of life that people really have been dealing with in silence and not really sharing and being open about when, wow, we have such a big community that is open to, to being leaned on and to share with and to help. So um, for myself, I, I said it earlier where like, I felt like if I was doing anything outside of track and field it felt like it felt like cheating it felt like sacrificing the gift and giving less than my best and it wasn't that i didn't want to set up life after this or that i was ready to retire when i did which i i was we had my our first daughter i was i was moving on i just it was like injury after injury after injury my my below the knee my feet hurt so bad i was just tired of being tired um so it was time. I was ready. I, I thought the U.S. championships would be my last in 17. And I backed into another uh, U.S. championships. And so I'm in London. And so that ended up being my last one. And I just, I teared up. I was telling our other, our other, our colleague at NBC, Lewis Johnson, I was telling him, like I had to walk back up to the little perch and was talking to him about, yeah, it's my last one. And I was, I'm tearing up and didn't have any words other than it's time. Like it's time for me to hang them up. And everything was fine. You know, I was ready to do it. I got to spend more time with my kids. We got pregnant with our second child. I went back to school and got my MBA and I did all these things that I thought were setting me up for the next phase of life. Now I've got all this, this, these extra tools. I've got all this, now I've got motivation. I've got this big family. We're growing. I want to, I want to do things with my life. I just didn't know what that was. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I didn't want to like jump right back into sports because I had done that for 20 years. There's a whole world out there of like, who knows what, you know? Um, and I, I just describe it as like every few months I was taking a step into the, into a pool and I was each, each, every couple of months, I just kept taking another step and taking another step and taking another step while all of this, pressure was adding weight to my body so by the time my head's underwater i don't have a lifeline i don't have a way out i don't have any of the tool tools to help me do this on my own 
And I, I don't want to gloss over all the, the, the little things that happen kind of along the way, but like, Kara, you were right next to me. It was the day after Colt was sitting next to me and we're watching, I we were watching like discus or something. And I, I told Paul, like, I barely watched the end of the meet and was like, I gotta go. He's like, everything okay? He's like, nope, but I got I gotta go, man. And started having a panic attack at the meet and ran from the stadium back to the hotel, like with a laptop bag and was just hoping no one saw me. And there's tens of thousands of fans on the streets and I'm just sprinting past them down the, down agate, down all those familiar streets. And yeah, it was just, I didn't know how I got there. I didn't know what was happening to me. But I, I felt like someone else was in control and, and pu pushing all the buttons. And that person was doing my day job. You know, that person was, was announcing. That person was doing all that stuff. And I, I was suffering way. I was underwater. And I was just way, way down. And I hadn't dealt with any of the emotion of what leaving that sport, what you can hear in my voice. I loved it. I loved track and field. I still do. I love getting up every day with a purpose and knowing I was put on this earth to be doing this right here, right now. And I know what that felt like. And I missed it. And I missed it like you missed, like, I missed it like when, when a loved one passes away, missed it. And I had never mourned. I had never grieved. I had never processed any of that. I had just, all right, next thing. Like even my like LinkedIn thing, subheading for like a year was like former world's best athlete looking for the next thing to be the best in the world at. And there, it wasn't, and it's hard to take the time to do that. We've got young kids, we've got a busy life. There's a lot going on. And I was still, there's so much to be grateful for. And I was stuck in this place feeling infinitely sad and feeling ashamed of being sad, feeling ashamed of, of why do I feel this way? My God, like, not in like an arrogant way, but like, I'm Trey Hardy. I've, I have got the life. Like I've, I, I've done it. I've got respect in my community. I've got a great group of friends. I've got the love of a beautiful, caring wife and a healthy freaking family. And what it like, get it together, like get it together. And I, I've texted, we have friends who are psychotherapists and, and psychiatrists, and I would text them like, hey, I just, I'm not feeling like myself. Like, I, I genuinely don't remember how to be happy. And we talked about, I talked to them about seeing somebody to get on, you know, SSRIs to, to deal with depression or to deal with just to like get my mood back up. And for some reason, I just kind of stood firm on not wanting to do pharmaceutical drugs. Just said, I don't want that. I'd been on Ritalin when I was a kid. I, I'm a healthy person at the time. I was just, I don't know. I just didn't want to do it. And it, the other thing I didn't do is become informed about them either. I just said no. And it almost cost me my life where couple days after, you know, sitting next to your son, having a great time at a track meet, I'm running into our hotel and everybody, I think every single person on the broadcast was reaching out to me and saying, Hey, Trey, we're going to dinner or, Hey, we're doing this or, Hey, is everything okay? And Paul Swangard, like every few minutes was like, Hey, what's going on? Are you okay? You okay? Are you okay? And at some point, I think I did send him like, I'm fine, see you tomorrow. Um, but I, I didn't go to bed that night till maybe 5 a.m. and like caught a nap. And I, I was just looking around the room and typing some really scary stuff in my journal about that. I was so far down in that shame of feeling bad and just feeling bad for feeling bad. Um, and at that point, everything's so cloudy. I have no reason. I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm not in control. It's this other entity. And I hadn't really 
experienced feelings in a long time. You know, everything's been so repressed that I'm just stuck, you know, and I'm looking around for something to take me out of my misery. I think it's um, you know, it's fascinating listening to your athletic story and being in charge of the emotions and being able to flip on a switch and being able to flip it off. And I always wonder, like, if those things, those lessons, those mental tools we teach ourselves, you get to post career point in your life and they're almost counterproductive because it's like, I'm actually really good at compartmentalizing, so I'm not going to talk to anyone about this. I'm not supposed to feel fear or fatigue or sadness about, I got to turn it off so I can do the next attempt or I can get ready for the next race. And there's this gap, you know, in learning the new tools, like who's going to teach us, what are the options? And part of me wonders if someone should be responsible for that. Is that a USATF? Is a USOC? Um, is there something that should be put in place and... I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's a certain person's responsibility or entity's responsibility, or these conversations are so important and so powerful because one, there's not that thing there. Uh, but two, like who else knows what that feels like? Who, like how many people in your life could you turn to that would understand where you've been, where you're at and where you need to get to? Um, what do you have any feelings on like, what was missing, what would have helped, what you would like to see changed? And I don't think that there's like, oh, here's, here's the answer. Here's how, you, here's how you solve it. I think there, I think what you said, I think the one thing that needs to be true is it needs to be people who've kind of been there, done that. Because there's instant validation in, in those feelings from someone who's been to the levels that someone going through it has been to. And I'd mentioned to somebody, um, I forget who it was, but that maybe there was an email that floated across like the USOPC emails that are like, they're always like jobs or trainings or something. Maybe there's a trend, maybe there was a transitioning out of the sport link. I, I just don't think it was kind of hammered home. It wasn't like a viable, like, oh, I've known about this resource for forever. Like, this is what I'm going to do when I retire. But it'd be really easy to set something up like that and make it mandatory. Like in order to, in order to compete at a U.S. championships, you have to attend this mandatory health and wellness thing. Or I don't know. I, there's, no, there's no one right answer, but it's a problem. And it's a way bigger problem than I thought just because of the reaction of the last, you know, couple of shows I've been on. The people that have reached out, everybody goes through this to some degree. That's what, when you said you knew you were never going to have that feeling again, like that feeling of competition and that feeling of accomplishing something you work so hard for, like it makes me choked up because I miss it so much. And I know my husband went through this as well. And it's really hard to describe to people. Like, I'm super fulfilled. I love my life. But I miss that so much. And so I just want to thank you for even just vocalizing that because I think a lot of us feel that way, but we feel embarrassed to say that. It feels silly to say like, I don't know why, but it feels silly to be like, I miss that feeling so much and I'm never going to have it again. And it is like, a, it's like grief. It's like you have yeah. to grieve it. It's a it's a fascinating thing because I think from the outside perspective, people go, oh, you miss the spotlight or you mm -hmm. miss the attention, mm -hmm. you miss the relevance. And like, yeah, I don't think that's it at all. I don't I think it's like you hear people talk about process and it sounds like cliche, but it's like oh, you miss the act of being in tune with yourself and like feel like you're fulfilling potential, um, all these different things. And I sent Trey and Kara, you the a clip from this podcast I heard where the guy was like, people um, look at champions and they, they want to figure out what they have that other people don't like, what is it that makes them get to the top? And this guy says, it's actually champions are broken. It's not what they have. It's what they're lacking. And it's the ability to turn off, like 
they don't have an off button. They keep going. And when you think about process and you think about being in the moment and doing all the work, like that's what makes people great. But when you get to the end, wh where do you put that energy? And you don't have the off button, so you try to fulfill it in a different way. And um, I think that, you know, looking at it from a perspective, like actually this machine is broken. And so we have to find a different way to take people down after that that high and, and you know, utilize that energy somewhere else. And that's the hard part is it's different for every single person. Yeah, yeah, you're right. His dog escaped. Um, this is heavy. Um, <laughs> I like started crying. I was not expecting I know. to. It's so I, hard, though. It is really hard. Like, I do miss it, you know? Like, I'm jealous that you still get to experience it. And I, I know can, it's still not the same yeah. as it used to be for you, but like, yeah, yeah, it's like, it's just so sad and it's so sudden. I compared it with Sarah Lorch Butler for a runner's world thing. It's like, it's the decision is like putting your dog down. Yes. Oh right? my God. Like you don't want to be the person who does it too soon. Yes. But you also don't want to be the person who makes yourself suffer or your family. So like, you don't want to go to suffering. So it's like, where's the, and there's no perfect time, but like, and having just put a dog down, I'm like, that's actually a very fair comparison. That is a totally fair comparison. Well, and every, like every athlete is terminally ill. There's an end date, you know? Um, the, and I didn't want to interrupt you, but one of the, the ways that I have started to think about it is that it was a drug. Like it was a way to help me process things going out every day and training and, and striving and reaching for something. Um, and, and it was an actual literal drug with adrenaline and the catecholamines and dopamine and all of that stuff that I was, my light switch, that's a drug. Like adrenaline is an actual addicted um, thing that you can grow accustomed to having. And I went cold turkey, you know, stopped working out stop going after all that kind of stuff did a lot more public speaking so there's a little bit of adrenaline there but it it was just it was a drug that i stopped and so i was going through withdrawals over over seasons and years and and adding more and more complicated adding real life to all of that uh as that was happening because i kind of suspended starting a family i'd suspended a lot of the stuff that you know, we would call like adulting, you know, I had, I had not, I hadn't been wearing all those hats yet, you know? I think it's so amazing though, that you're sharing this because Des listened to the podcast that you were on. I did, my husband did, and we all related at parts like Des is still competing, but she's also in a place that's weird for her, right? She knows her best days are behind her. I'm not trying to speak for you, Des, but like, it's, it's true. You know, like her, she's probably not going to PR. Um, doesn't mean, I mean, she doesn't mean she can't run solid. She just ran 227 at Boston, whoop, whoop, but still, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think I just appreciate you talking about it because I think it becomes almost like this, you use the word shame sort of. That's how I felt. That's how Adam felt. Like, why am I, why do I feel this way? I accomplished all these things and I have a great life and I have other things I can be doing. Why am I hung up on the past or or getting back this feeling that I'm never like, why am I hung up on that instead of enjoying everything I have? And I just appreciated you humanizing it and, and talking about it. And because I think a lot of us feel that way and it makes me feel less embarrassed to say, yeah, for two years I was totally depressed, like well, really depressed. Yeah. In, in the outside world too, like just in the past couple of weeks, it was like, I think you commented on my Boston post and someone replied to you like, yes, why doesn't she retire? Why doesn't Sarah retire? Like, you know, like people, I don't know what the intention is, but it's, there's, there's a lot of heaviness to it. And so to chime in on someone's decisions or where they're at or how they're doing it, um, I don't get frustrated with a lot of comments, but that one was like, I'm just deleting this. And then I saw a similar thing with Lolo Jones, you know, and she's like, Hey dude, I'm in, I, 
I still can and I'm enjoying it. Why not? So to like weigh in on anyone's decision making through this, um, to me, it's like that's an out of bounds, like, you know, blocked. See you later. A hundred percent. Nobody knows what it's like unless they've been in it and you get to make that decision. You know, I think I didn't get to make that decision. And I think that's made it even harder at times for me. Like I, I thought I would go to Rio and that would be it, but then I didn't get to go to Rio. And then I was like trying to create that magical moment for myself. And I did that for like two years and it was so awful because this, this ship had sailed, but I was still trying to like make this moment so that I could walk away when I wanted, you know? Um, and that's, it's just really hard. Like, even though Trey said, yeah, I'm done in this moment, I'm done. It's you. Yeah. It's just, it's not what you think it's going to be. And no one should be, no one should say anything. I was so pissed when I saw that comment. I didn't even see it, but you wrote like WTF. And then I like went all in. I was like, blah, blah, blah. and then you just deleted it, which was the right thing to do. But it's just so dismissive of a human being who is day in, day out, trying to be the best they can be, showing up for all of these people. It's just so dismissive of who you are and who, tra- like all of us are real human beings. We're not performers. Yeah. And I mean, I think social media well, yeah. is There's incredible, <laughs> but that's, that's the one thing that everybody has against it is how it is just a dehumanizing, easy thing to be a keyboard warrior and to just flippantly um comment about real people that they would never ever say that to your face ever and the other side of that coin is i did not think any of this would have come about like i received hundreds and hundreds of messages and not like think about your tray real personal messages that took me hours, hours and hours and hours just to to personally respond to that were all so supportive and so great and so affirming in what I have been going through and um and what we're doing, like what this is and what what we get to talk about is like kind of the only saving grace of those of those platforms. That for every one just piece of human garbage, there is a hundred other really good people that see themselves in you, that see themselves in in your struggles and your successes. Um, and it just was, and even then, my me kind of, I'm not the first to to have gone through it or the first to talk about it. And I had gone into that show not, I wasn't planning on saying anything like not plan on saying anything at all. I haven't like when I called my wife after the show, I was like, Hey, I ended up just talking about this past summer. She's like, Oh, wh- is that good or bad? Like, what do you, how do you feel about it? And I was like, I don't know, but I kind of hope maybe if it, maybe one person hears it, they're, it'll stop them or it'll, they'll, they'll reach out or something. I don't, I was like, I don't know though. And then I had, kind of forgotten the way you kind of forget that you've done stuff and it goes to print you're like oh yeah i forgot about the interview and he sent it to me he's like hey here are the clips what do you think any anything off limits and i was like nope i think that's a really good way to way to hand it off and to to put it out there and yeah it's it's i wish there was an answer i wish there was like oh here step one Step two, um, but I do know that the really the first step, if there is any, is talking about it, you know, and just being open with how you feel and not holding any of that in and not feeling, you know, I feel like shame is what you're projecting other people's feelings about you to be really, you know, you, it's not, it's not really how I feel about myself. It's what I think people feel about me because of how I feel. And in that projecting onto anybody in any circumstance is just not healthy. So getting to talk to people opened me up to this, like to receive care and receive goodness and feel like I, I'm, I matter to people and that it's important and we're all connected and share. Like you said, Kara, everybody's gone through this and that connectedness builds that 
I don't know, it just builds relationships and vulnerability, builds communities, and, and it just is a good thing. Like, it's a really good thing. I agree. I think um, you said there is no step one, but if we're figuring it out and we're trying to solve and we're trying to change, Trey, I think that was the first step is just having the conversation. And suddenly you look around and go, oh, a lot of people experience this. There isn't shame in it. And it feels like the shame, but it's like, this is actually very, very normal. So I appreciate you taking the first step. And I think I think it's going to help a ton of people. So thank you. I mean, I think it's helped Des and I. Like we've been texting about it. It has definitely helped me and Adam. It allowed us to have this conversation that we, I mean, we both saw each other struggle, but it allowed us to have this conversation. And I, I think it's really important. I hate it when people say, oh, you're so brave. Blah, blah. But I think it was brave. Because I can't come up with a better word and I know you're dying, <laughs> but I think it is like you let yourself be vulnerable. But in that moment, you let a, a lot of other people feel seen. And that's that's good. That wasn't the plan and it wasn't a part of any of it, but it just is it is what it is. It's kind of like we talked about earlier, like I was very blessed to do what I got to do, but I just I did what I was supposed to do at every step of the way. And I think that's how this this is as well. I think any of my friends that been around me long enough no that's the kind of guy that I am like as soon as you get past the guard you know and you're in the 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 circle I'm I'm kind of an open book and um which is probably why it it is shocking when people you perceive from the outside are going through something like whoa what whoa really um so there's fear in 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 keeping it close to the vest and not wanting other people to, you know, perceive you in, in that way, perceive you as maybe being like, you don't have it all together or you're weak or I don't know. It, it's, there wasn't a lot of that trying to like hold me back, but I wasn't also going to, you're not going to put it on in your Instagram post, like really struggling right now. I'm looking for stuff to kill myself on a, on a story. So it just, we tend to suffer in silence out of, out of not wanting to, I don't know, for me to drag other people down into it because this is my battle. And this is me, again, projecting the shame that I think I should be feeling. Um, so, and thank you guys for like me. I mean, both of you, yeah, immediately reaching out and, um, Really appreciate you guys like initiating this conversation. I thought I would come on the show and we would talk about like fun NBC stuff, but this was like, again, this is an important conversation. And I think especially if one for your audience where there's going to come a point in time in every runner's life where they've run their last mile, you know, where they, they can't, they can't lace them up anymore, whether that's, you know, injury or circumstances or what have you and there is there is a process of grieving the loss of something that you hold dear no matter what shape or form it takes like we lost a tree in our yard for the ice storm that i truly thought was the most beautiful tree i grieved that shit like i <laughs> uh, the same way you putting putting a pet down the same way you do anything that when you when you lose something that you love and i just hadn't done that and I hadn't hadn't even occurred to me to to do any of that, and didn't realize I was using all of these things and competing and training and all the getting a, a master's and starting all these businesses, and I was using that to kind of mask over the fact that I hadn't grieved. I was just staying busy and staying busy and staying busy, and then all of a sudden, whoa! Oh, is that an avalanche? Like, oh shoot, we should get out of here. And then by the time I realized, it was too late. And lucky to have the the family and a wife that I have to put up with my bullshit for the last six years. It, it has not been easy. And it's not to say every day is doom and gloom, but I was, I was not fun to be around. It was really, really hard, really hard. So people want to help and they can't help unless they know what's going on. Well, Trey, we can have you back on and we can talk about NBC. Perfect. I think we, I think we should. 
Perfect. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we could have you back. Like, we love you. And we have a lot more we could talk about. So. Reoccurring guest, yeah. Trey Hardy. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're doing a live show from some track beat. We got yes, to, please. We and we get the like get the squad in and get like I want Lewis to tell stories. I want Otto to tell stories. I want yeah. Otto's and pretty shy I, though. Do you think we could squeeze him out of him? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> he'll probably he'll make you do it on his like Instagram live. It'll have to be at Otto Bolden or something. But we, I want to do a mystery science theater style like track meet where we're just talking over another image. It could be an old track meet too, so no one gets sad or pissed off but like we're really funny everybody like it's the like we're like it's a bunch of old heads that love track that know most everything about track since the late 80s you know like we know everything that's gone on and it's it would be really fun it would be super fun to do like a mystery science theater for like the 1991 world championships or something. It would be so funny. And some of our production meetings, I've, I, I laugh harder at production meetings than like other things in my life. Like Otto is riffing on this athlete or you have a comment or I'm sure Des has been in those situations and you're just like, this is freaking hilarious. Like I'm laughing so hard. And now then we have to go on live TV and be like professional, Dude, but it's, it is. That up. Don't yeah. even think about it. <laughs> Don't even put that out. Yeah. Stop making yeah. me laugh. Yeah. It's really fun. But then we'll all, always like lean forward and look at the like down the line when they're talking about whatever it was. Like when Otto's, you know, Otto has to like they're arguing about lanes and who they have to talk to. And you're just like, oh, he's doing OK. He's doing a good job. OK. He made it through. You know? Yes. We what should a do crazy, that. What a crazy job. Like we're, we're, we're on. We do, we do television. TV. Like real TV. Not like. We don't have a YouTube channel. Like it's it, it is always crazy. surprising. You're like, they. I can't believe they let me do this. Right? Totally, you know? right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not training. qualified <laughs> to be here. You know, I, yeah. I drop F-bombs all the time. Like, I'm not qualified <laughs> to be right here right now with a microphone that's fear. streaming live. <laughs> that's but my somehow biggest all three fear. of us got this job. If you ever look over at me, I've half the show, I have my hand on the cough button because I'm terrified <laughs> of like, saying something to Paul or somebody else that's like negative or like, oh, do you see that? That was terrible. Or like, oof, she looks awful. She's not winning today. Like so, <laughs> something that's tr profoundly true, but just not something I would want to be on air. Yeah, it's you got to clean it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got to do it. Damn. All right. I'm into it. Just going to finish reading this book real quick. <laughs> <laughs> love it promo got a little Perfect. ways to go yeah i love the format though des and then kara i've already told you what a badass you are but i i read lauren's read kara's and now i'm getting through des's right now and i just i feel so lucky to know you guys like just personally and just i can't wait to read these to my daughters and make and make them read it and like tell them about the stuff that my wife did and just show them because I got two girls and just show them what what badass women look like you know and give them that that path and the way same way that I had a path of like really great athletes to follow like here's how you do it and um yeah thank you both for taking the incredible amount of time and courage it takes to write a book um and standing for what you stand for in everything I've already told all this to you personally. We love yeah. you, Trey. But this see, you. Trey's always trying to make it about us, but this right. is actually Just about you. Just yeah, spin. but we appreciate it. And you're real and you have reached out to all of us. And that's one of the things we love about you. Like you're just a great guy and you're very supportive. And we appreciate you giving us so much time to come on our podcast today when in fact we did ask you if he would come yes. on and talk to us. <laughs> And my, what was my response? Like, F yeah. Like, I've been waiting my whole life for this. Yeah. <laughs> episode 10-ish. Is it I'm episode gonna, 10? I'm going to stop counting. Yeah. No, it's going to be it's gonna be 12. This will yeah. be 12. It's your early days. You know the decathlon is like 10 events, right? This would just be uh, perfect. Well, sorry. Season one. It. it takes. We already released it. 10. We let you down. Okay. Wait, no. What was 10? Is like, Nine was TCS. It bought no, that Boston, actually was right? 10. We had we had miscounted. Yeah. 
I'm going to stop using through. the numbers. <laughs> We're not going to say this numbers anymore. Much, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a great one though. I'm sure we should probably wrap this up, but yeah. this is going to be a great one. I'm so excited you came on. So I'm going to let Des wrap it, but I am just going to say one more time on camera. Thank you so much. We love you. And I can't wait to see you this summer. Heck yeah. In the booth. Fun summer. I think that's great. Thank you, Trey. Thank you for sharing your story. You're going to change lives. Um, we appreciate you in this isn't goodbye. This is see you later, buddy. Heck yeah. Thank you guys both. Dream come true being on Nobody Asked Us <laughs> with Des and Kara. Brought to you by TCS. <laughs> I didn't want to miss the plug.